Let's try and fit all of magnetic fields onto one piece of paper. A lot of this stuff is good for GCSE as well as A-level. You can download both versions of the PDF from scienceshorts.net. Here's a magnet with north and south poles. Actually, their full names are north facing and south facing poles. Here I've drawn some field lines to represent the invisible field around a magnet. And they show the direction of the force on a mini north pole, as it were. And so that means they go away from a north pole because it would repel a north pole and go towards a south pole because it would attract a north pole. If you have two magnets and opposite poles facing each other, then the field lines will go from the north pole of one to the south pole of the other. But if you have two like poles, like north and north and south and south facing each other, the field lines will squash together but still not touch. Magnetic field strength, the proper name is actually magnetic flux density. The symbol is capital B and the unit is capital T for Tesla. For A-level you need to know the alternative units, that's V per meter square and Newtons per ampere meter. You also need to know that flux density is equal to flux divided by area, so phi divided by A. So that means that phi equals BA, very important. Even at GCSE, you now need to know the equation for force on a wire carrying a current in a magnetic field. That is, if they're all perpendicular, it's F equals BIL. F bill. We can measure this force by putting magnets on a yoke, putting that on a top hand balance, put a current through the wire, and then we can record what mass the balance shows. And then we can times that by 9.81 times by G to find the force that is acting on the wire. So we also need to know what the direction of the force is going to be. And that's where Fleming's left hand rule comes in. People always take the mick out of my left hand. So I'm going to try and do a good job this time. I'm actually pretty proud of that one. I think that's probably the best I've ever drawn. Joffed. It's freeze FBI, thumb is force, first finger is field, second finger is current. And they're all 90 degrees to each other. The current in this is conventional current. For GCSE, that doesn't really mean anything, but at A level, you need to know that when it comes to free moving charged particles, this second finger is in the right direction for protons and other positive charges moving, but we need to flip it for negative charges like electrons. So F bill and forces on wires is called the motor effect. And we can use this idea in what we call a motor. We have a magnetic field made by two magnets and we have a coil of wire. Now, usually they're gonna be thousands of turns and loops and that's attached to the power supply via a split ring commutator. And that's there to make sure that the current flips every half a turn. If the current goes around the loop the same way all the time, then it will just go to the vertical position and then just stop, it won't go any further. The opposite of the motor effect is the dynamo effect so it's all about when a wire experiences a changing magnetic field or a level change in flux. That's when currents are induced in wires. And dynamos are basically motors, but we turn them and current is induced in the coil. They're very similar, but we don't need a split ring commutator this time. We can just connect the loop to the circuit with brushes. We're okay with the current flipping every half a turn when it comes out. Just means that it's AC and that's fine. If you want to increase the output of a dynamo, then you can put more turns, more loops in the coil. You can use a stronger magnetic field, or you can obviously just turn it faster. For a motor, if you want to increase the speed, then the first two for the dynamo also apply, but then we can increase the voltage or PD of the motor and that will make it turn faster. An A level if we want to find out the direction of the current then we use Fleming's right hand rule. Before we go into Lenz's law let's have a look at transformers because that's a GCSE as well. We need them to step up voltage and step down current outside of a power station before the electricity goes to the national grid. And then we have transformers the other end outside our houses to step down the voltage this time ready for us to use. And the reason we step up the voltage outside the power station is to reduce the energy lost in the cables due to their resistance. If we have a lower current then that means that we have less power or less energy lost due to heating. Okay, this is your basic transform. We have a primary coil on one side and a secondary coil on the other side. Now we have this soft iron core in the middle. Just be clear, there should be no electricity in the iron core at all, just in the wires wrapped around it. But there is a magnetic field in the core. If it's 100% efficient, then that means the power going in should equal the power coming out. Ideally, we can therefore say that V times I, that's power, is the same across both. So V1 I1 equals V2 I2. And this is a step up transformer because we can see that the secondary coil has twice the number of turns than the primary coil. So we should have double the voltage out and therefore half the current. The more turns we have, the higher voltage. So therefore we can say the ratio of the voltages is equal to the ratio of the number of turns. V1 over V2 equals N1 over N2. And at A level, you need to know that the voltage steps up because the more turns we have, the more flux we're capturing with that coil as it were. 
There's one more thing about the structure of transformers that you need to know for GCSE. I'll write that down in a few minutes. Okay, that's pretty much it for GCSE. Everything from now on is just going to be A-level. Look at Lenz's law. You need to know this back to front. The direction of induced EMF is such that it will oppose the change that caused it. That's the definition. In other words, if a current is induced, it will make its own field that will try to stop the change that actually caused it to begin with. Currents don't like being induced. Classic example of this is just a magnet and a coil of wire attached to an ammeter. And then we have a magnet being dropped through it. When the magnet's dropped, a current is induced and that will make the ammeter deflect one way. The current makes its own field that balances the weight of the magnet. So therefore we have balanced forces, so therefore it falls at a constant speed. Now between the top and the bottom, the current will flip because it doesn't want the magnet to leave because induced currents are fickle like that. So the ammeter will deflect the other way as well. Once it's all the way out, the current will of course go down to zero again. And Lenz's law applies to transformers because if a current is allowed to be induced in the secondary coil, then the current flowing will actually make its own magnetic field as well that will try and induce a back EMF in the primary coil. So the current that is induced in the secondary coil doesn't want to be there. So if there's no secondary coil or the circuit is disconnected, then that means the primary coil, well, the current can just flow freely. But if we do have a circuit attached to the secondary coil, then that current induced will provide a back EMF that will reduce the current in the primary coil, which actually is a good thing. Faraday's law is this. Induced EMF is proportional to the rate of change in flux. Here's the equation. Epsilon equals minus. That's just for Lenz's law showing that it's the opposite. We don't really care about it. It's not important. And then delta phi by delta t, rate of change of flux. And yeah, we can times by n as well to get the actual EMF induced if we times by the number of turns in the coil. So here's something that counts for GCSE as well. There's three things that you can do to reduce energy losses in a transformer. Number one, you can use low resistance windings for the coils. So just low resistance wires, copper, we say that we make it with a soft iron core. That means that it's easily magnetized and demagnetized. So that way you end up with a really strong magnetic field inside of the core and not a lot of the field escaping as it were. Then finally we have a laminated or layered core. We split the core into layers. And this is to reduce the effect of eddy currents. Now we said we don't want any electricity in the core, but inevitably you're going to get a little bit of current induced in the core itself. And then it just goes round and round. And because of the resistance of the core, you end up with energy being lost as heat. So laminating the core reduces these eddy currents. Okay, just eight level again. Faraday's law can be tweaked to be applied to a wire being moved through a field that is perpendicular to the field lines. And the EMF induced is equal to BL, V, V being the velocity of the wire through the field. If you don't know where that comes from, have a look at my Faraday's Law videos. N phi is given its own name, that's called flux linkage, and that's equal to therefore BAN, BAN. That gives you the total amount of flux that's being captured by a coil. So the unit is not just Weber's, it's Weber turns. BLV can also be applied to a rectangular coil that is entering and exiting a magnetic field. Here's a field that I've drawn to show that the field lines are going into the page. One side of the coil is going in, so we can use BLV for that. If it's going at constant speed, then we have a constant EMF as it's entering. Once it's all the way in, we don't have any EMF. When it's exiting, we have a constant EMF again but it's going to be negative if it was positive when entering. Okay, let's have a look at free charged particles in a field. We know that if their velocity is perpendicular to the field, then they will undergo circular motion. The magnetic force on the particle is equal to BQV, and so we know that's also equal to MV squared over R. Then we can cancel one of the Vs and we can see how things are proportional to each other. Cyclotrons are used to make beams of particles like a proton beam for therapy in a hospital. And we have two Ds and we apply a PD across them. And that's in order to accelerate the protons as they cross the gap and their radius increases. But we must make sure we flip the polarity of the Ds every half an orbit of these protons. Therefore, the frequency of the AC we apply to the Ds is going to be the same as the frequency of the particles orbits. And yes, they all have the same frequency and same time period because it is independent to radius. If you don't know how to prove that, again, look at my magnetic fields lessons. Another application is mass spectrometry. We take atoms or molecules, we ionize them, so they're positively charged. First of all, we put them through a velocity selector where we have an electric and a magnetic field. 
and it's only particles that have a speed that is equal to the electric field strength divided by the flux density go all the way through. They're the only ones for which force due to the electric field and the force due to the magnetic field are equal and opposite. Once through, they go into another magnetic field. Lighter ions get deflected more from the equation we just saw. Radius is proportional to mass. So we have sensors at these particular positions where they end up. We can tell how many ions we have relative to the other ones. We can use this to find relative abundance of isotopes, for instance. Okay, here's a dynamo or generator. Here's the field going to the right. When the coil is perpendicular to the field lines, we have maximum flux going through the loop, but we actually have no EMF at that point. But when the coil is in line with the field, we have no flux, but we do have maximum EMF. Just because it's at that point that the flux is changing at the greatest rate, kind of like SHM. EMF at any point is given by ban omega sine omega t. So therefore the maximum EMF, we can call that epsilon zero, is equal to just ban omega. That's also equal to BLV. Okay, we might have to times by n to get it for a coil with multiple turns. Here's a graph of flux linkage, ban against time. To get the maximum EMF, we can either use ban omega or we can get the gradient when we have no flux linkage. That's the maximum gradient. Much more accurate to use the equation though. Okay, let's go back to Lenz's law. Let's finish off back EMF. This happens in a transformer like we've seen already, but it also happens in motors. When the motor is made to spin, that actually has a bit of dynamo effect as well. And so we have an EMF induced in the coil that's actually trying to battle the voltage that's making the motor spin. It's a good thing because that reduces the current in the coil in the motor. So when a motor is spinning fast, we can say it has a light load. We have a high back EMF, so the current is small. But if we have a heavy load, or if we stop the motor from spinning, there's gonna be less back EMF produced. So that means the current is gonna be quite high in the coil. And actually that's why motors burn out if they're under too heavy load. Power station, it has a generator in, but actually the magnet is in the middle. Well, it's an electromagnet. And then we actually have three sets of coils or stators around the outside. That makes three currents that then go to the national grid. We call those three phases. Houses just use one phase, but factories can combine all three phases to get a really high voltage. Overhead cables, they have a steel core, that's for strength, and then they're surrounded by aluminium. Aluminium is good because it has a fairly low resistance, but it's far lighter and far cheaper than copper. Finally, to find the power lost in cables, we can't just use the voltage from the power station and do V squared divided by R. No, instead we need to do P equals VI for the power station first to get the current that's coming out, and then we plug that into I squared R to find the power lost in the cables. So that's it. I hope you found that helpful. If you did, please leave a like. And if you want to test your knowledge on this stuff, then click on the card and it'll take you to my flashcard questions. See you there.